psychologist. Let me go back to the history. This patient was referred to me two weeks ago for fluorescein angiography. He was referred from one of my colleagues and I did fluorescein angiography. And I'm showing you the picture. He had the right proliferative diabetic tonopathy, severe ischemia, a lot of MVEs, nasally, superiorly, and an this MVD. Refer to me. And this is the left eye. You can see he has also proliferative diabetic retinopathy and NVD and NVE on the nasal side. This was the initial presentation. So after the patient had the injection, you, okay. So this is pre and post injection in the right eye. So he presented to me again. He told me I lost my vision in the right eye two days after intravitreal injection. So let me stop here and ask Dr. Amani and let's chat together. What is the incidence of vascular occlusion after intravitreal intervention? Because I've never seen a case of central retinal artery except this one in my career. And do we have to monitor these patients immediately after intravitreal antivegif? And does the volume matter if we inject a larger volume? And we do, do we need to do paracentesis for these cases or not? Can you answer these questions, Dr. Amani, chat with me for that? Yeah, so really I've not, I've not experienced this because uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very dramatic. Yeah. I and mean, the worst complication that we've seen is usually endophthalmitis and that happens two or three days later. This uh, immediate um, vascular occlusion, I have not seen. Our practice normally, we, after we inject the patient, I check their vision. So I say, can you see my hand? So I make sure there's not an immediate drop in vision. And we usually check their intraocular pressure before they leave the practice. So I think those are two important things. So if you, if you check their vision immediately, you can, if, if, if they're completely, if their vision is completely black, you know that the intraocular pressure is very, very high and you can try to monitor these patients in, in your uh, chair. If, if the vision doesn't come back quickly, then I usually try to do a paracentesis to try to relieve the intraocular pressure. So I think that's the main thing that happens is, is severe rise in intraocular pressure in an eye with compromised um, outflow facility, and then they're unable to lower the pressure on the, by, the, by their own. So you, you might want to monitor the intraocular pressure immediately. Let me tell you a scenario with this patient. I asked him, how come you didn't notice that you lost your vision? And his answer was, after the injection, the doctor told me, keep the eye cover. It was Thursday, and it's Thursday and Friday is a weekend. And wow. come on Saturday in the afternoon, don't remove the cover, and I will check you on Saturday. Wow. So this yeah, is yeah, yeah, another big mistake. You should tell the patient to monitor the vision. Sometimes they see floaters, sometimes they, you know, they complain of little things. But if the patient is uncovering his eye and notice that there is no light, at least he will call his doctor or will try to seek advice. So this is another important issue in Egypt. Don't let the patient cover his eye all the time because I do that for a few hours. Unless the patient is from nearby, I tell him, once you go home, uncover your eye. I check him, as Dr. Amani said, after the operation, I remove the cover. But you know why I cover the eye? Because I have local anesthesia, like whatever. So I don't want to, the, 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 the patient goes out and has dust in his eyes or anything he cannot feel and he hurt his eyes. So once he goes home, I tell him, after examining him, I tell him, check your vision and call me if anything happens in the next few days. Otherwise, I would see him in the next day. As the Dr. Amani said, preoperative evaluation of the intraocular pressure is very important because some of these patients are glaucomatous and you would never think about it. Second thing, the volume of the intravitreal injection. Sometimes we inject Avastin, we give 0.1 millimeter instead of 0.05. And sometimes the pressure is higher than expected. And I always look at the fundus and I see if there's any pulsation in the optic nerve head. So I would know that the pressure is getting high. And as Dr. Amani said, if anything happens, we should do paracentesis immediately to catch this patient. Mm -hmm. Let me go from there. What should I do for the other eye? The patient is coming for me for the other eye. And this is the literature. It is recorded, central retinal artery occlusion. And wow. they said in their conclusion that vascular event may be associated with the underlying ocular disease. These patients are diabetic, hypertensive. Sometimes they have high lipid uh, profile and some of the systemic disease with the thromboembolic phenomena, they are 
you know, liable to get vascular incidents. And in this paper, they said they have four cases of artery occlusion, and they relied that, that it may be related to increased intracardial pressure. This is, as Dr. Amani said. Second thing, constraining for further any already poor retinal perfusion. If the patient is severely ischemic, and sometimes we miss that this patient had new vascular glucose and very low pressure, 20s, and we inject, the pressure is getting high, and sometimes inflammatory reaction happens, the, the pressure is getting high. And the last thing, vasoconstrictor effect of the anti -BEGF. So this paper is attributing these cases to this event. Let me go to the left eye. And look at the left eye clearly because this is my problem now. The patient is asking me, what are you going to do for this eye? For me, you see a lot of NVEs. It's even more than the first presentation. The first presentation has only nasal NVEs. Now he had nasal, inferior, NVD is obvious, and he had macular edema, which encroaching of the fovea. And this is a line scan through the edema. And this is what I should do for him. Visual act is 2060. Patient has a partial PVD with a thickened posterior hyaloid encroaching on the fovea and the macula. There is a mild traction, as you see, Dr. Amani. And mm. I was consulting with the patient. He asked me first direct question. Are you going to inject me anti vegf again in this eye? And I discussed all the options. I told him I should do that because you have macular edema involving the fovea. Though I can start laser photocoagulation because the involvement is not that much and PRP, focal and PRP. And the patient looked at me and I said, you know, I'm scared to have anything touching my eye because this is the only seeing eye and I'm, I'm satisfied with this vision. I told him, this is my options and you have to think about it. Mm. What do you think, Dr. Amani? What should I do for him, laser or start injecting in this eye? So I, I think, like you said, the patient is afraid, you know, and I think the macular edema at this point at least is an extra foveal area. So you yes. might want to start with laser, give him a chance to sort of get used to um, to the laser. I start usually with very peripheral laser, uh, very anterior laser, and then I gradually go more posteriorly to try to decrease the risk of, uh, you know, the traction getting worse or the macular edema getting worse. And then maybe a small grid in the area of, of the edema that's uh, red and white in the supratemporal area. Yes, yes. Encroaching the fovea. Yeah, yeah, the area encroaching. We can pick up the areas like, I mean, if I show you the, the picture, we can we can yeah. highlight these areas and we can yeah. do that. This is what I told the patient. Let's start with laser. And then after that, if the edema increase, we would need the injection later on. And I okay. tried to calm him down, but unfortunately the patient disappeared for two weeks. He was going around taking second, third and fourth opinion. Yeah. And he presented with this. Yeah. One month later, four weeks later, 2080 vision, he dropped one more line and cystoid macular edema involving the fall. Yeah. So yeah. he left me no choice. Yeah. And I was worried about this mild traction on the nasal side because this is from the NVD. We all know that once PVD happens and we have NVD, we have cellular element on the surface of the macula and we can have proliferation on the surface of the vitreous starting like this mild traction on the nasal side of the neck. So when he came back to me, he said, let's start laser. I said, it's too late. We cannot laser this time because it's center involving diabetic macular edema. And if I will start laser, it will be for the, you know, new vascular, for the, the uh, PRP, for the proliferative, but not the macula, and the macula might get worse in this case. So he left me no choice. And I told him, I'm gonna change the type of injection, and I will start with ILEA because I needed, you know, um, as, as the protocol, he said, it's 2080, so it's worse vision. I would start with the best drug, and I started with him with ILEA. Mm -hmm. And this is after post three ILEA. And I did, as you see, as Dr. Amani said, focal areas, because this area was severely ischemic temper to the macula, and you can see very light laser scars. And I did three injections. The patient had almost cleared up the macular edema, vision regained 2030 in this eye. And astonishingly, PVD happens because sometimes mild adhesion of the vitreous, even with the cellular proliferation, you might have mechanical separation of the uh, vitreous, and this is what happened. And we can see the central foveal ticks is 243 uh, micron and minimal edema on the temporal side. It's almost 350. And I didn't want to interfere more than that. And I told him, you are on the safe side now. This is as protocol T and all the protocols said, it does not prevent recurrence. 
So the patient was happy for some time, satisfied, and then recurrent macular edema happens in the next few months. As we all know, most of the patients, they require almost three to six injections in the first year, but I kept injecting him once he comes in, and I did not use treat and extend in this. I only injected when I need. So when he came back with this recurrence, I injected him back again and again until I got a very dry macula and it took me 12 injections in five years, uh, divided into the five years. And the last year, which the 2020 had only one injection in January and he's doing fine up to now. And this is his last visit. So as we see here, some of the photoreceptors are damaged and the six nine vision is due to residual macular ischemia, as we can see here, very clearly delineated by the OCTA. And we can see a thin epiretinal membrane, which is not harmful in this patient. The only thing annoying this patient is a lot of floaters inside the eye, and some of them are, uh, you know, shining floaters or, you know, reflecting floaters. And I looked at it and I found small, tiny refractile bodies inside the vitreous. And we all know that this happens from repeated injection due to the syringe. We have like mm. a silicone bubble in the vitreous. This is the annoying thing for the patient. He always comes to me and say, I have some shining or glowing particles inside my, uh, si my vision and inside my vitreous. And I can see it clearly in the sun. And this is because of the repeated injection. But as we can see here, we can have the laser marks temporal to the foyer because this area was severely ischemic. I did a full scatter PRP nasally, superiorly, inferiorly up to the equator. I'm still monitoring this patient every now and then. And I would ask Dr. Amani if you need to comment anything on this case, that you have done anything more for this or not. Before um, I I'm, I'm wondering about the, the bubbles. So do, do, you, um, do you get this with IVIA? Because in the United States, we only get it with, uh, with Avastin. Uh, with yes. The formulated Avastin. We have never I, seen I, I, I know that he had one Avastin at the beginning, but after wow. that, all of this, I gave Ilya. It could be to the first injection, I don't know, but okay. it's still bothering the patient. Wow. Why do you think it's with Avastin only, not with the Ilya? Why, why is that high incidence with Avastin? I so know the, that. The idea about the, the source of these bubbles is the, is the actual needle. So yes. they, when they prepare the needles, they soak them in the silicone to make them uh, very smooth. So the type of needle preparation. So there are certain needles that have silicone in the preparation, and those are the ones that are more likely to give you um, these bubbles. And, and usually the ones that come with the ILEA bottle, they don't have those types of needles. So if you just, if you see it, you need to look at the type of needle that you're using and, and maybe switch brands and, and look at the manufacturer's uh, product how they make those needles. Let, let me tell you one thing. We, we, we don't have syringe coming with ILEA in here. ILEA only with yeah. the tip. We don't have syringe coming with it. Yeah. So no, we, have a, we get, we get a, yeah, a needle with the actual, with the ILEA. And, and these days we have ILEA prepackaged. So it comes yes. not, not in a vial, actually in a, in a syringe already prepackaged. The same with uh, Lucentis. They come prepackaged in a syringe with, with, a, with a separate needle in, in the box. This is another point I wanted to raise because this is what happens in, in all of our countries because we have syringe, we don't, we use our syringes. I mean, I get the syringes from different sources, but yeah. as you said, the prepacked now, you never get this with the prepacked syringes. So this is another option in the injection. So Let there's a couple of uh, questions from the audience. Uh, someone is asking if you always put a uh, eye patch after the injection. So I think that's an important question. I personally uh, don't do it unless the patient is, is very irritated and very uh, dry uh, because we only use topical injections. We don't give them peribulbar. Uh, but if, if the patient is very sensitive and very irritated, I usually put it and tell them to take it as soon as they go home. I do it all the time in Egypt before the patient leaves the hospital because it's already like, you know, I say, as you said, local anesthesia drops, but sometimes the patient might, you know, scratch his eyes. He might be exposed while he's reaching his, uh, you know, town. So I tell him 20 minutes, 30 minutes, once you reach home, you should take the cover out. But I always do that. So I'm afraid that the patient might hurt his eye or any foreign body will get inside the eye and he get irritated and he call me when he, once he gets home, it's a dusty or anything something gets in his eye and I would think that something wrong with the injection and if it comes out sometimes it is exposure to the air or the dust. So I always tell him once you reach home, you take the cover out and you never cover it again. 
So this is not my take home message because we are staying home. So this is a stay home <laughs> message. Intravitreal anti vegf is still the standard of care. We should not rush to any other drug. An intravitreal injection has local and systemic adverse effect, a lot of you know, adverse effects. And this is one of the most serious after endotomysis with centralitreal artery occlusion. Though I think it's more serious because sometimes you can save the eye with endopsalmitis. If you catch it early, do vitrectomy, you can have some vision, but in centralitreal artery occlusion, if he comes late, it's gone. And evaluating local like glaucoma or control systemic risk factor might avoid adverse events and intravitreal anti is not contraindicated with mild vitreal macular infection without jeopardizing the macula, and PRP is always indicated in case of high-risk proliferative diabetic retinopathy. I would so, stop uh, sharing my screen, and if you have any, did you see any question, Dr. Amani, so we can... There was know, another answer. question about uh, prophylactic antibiotics. If you use them um, um, regularly, uh, preoperative prophylactic antibiotics, in the United States, we don't use them. Um, we use a lot of betadine during the injections. That's how we sterilize the field, and we think betadine is, a, is very powerful. Uh, so we don't use preoperative um, antibi antibiotics. I don't know about Dr. Magdi. I, I do. I still do a couple of days before the injection, and two days after the injection, I would start with the antibiotic drop. We still do that because we don't know, uh, you know, the, the, the culture of our patients sometimes is different. Some people are not, you know, so careful, but I still use antibiotics prior to the injection for two days. It doesn't harm. For me, it's, it's working fine, but uh, I still use it. Right. So um, I think someone commented about the NVD on the OCT. I think that's a very good point. Sometimes you see this thick material on top of the OCT, on top of the nerve. It can give you a clue that there could be NVD there. Um, and, um, and I think that's a very good point. So if, uh, if, if people have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and then Dr. Magdi will manage the chat um, sure. questions for us uh, for this case. So this is a sort of a bread and butter type of case also similar to the first case Dr. Magdi presented and it's uh, more about uh, macular degeneration. So this is a Hispanic female who had decreased vision in her left eye and if you could see here, I asked her certain questions about using steroids or history of trauma, and there's a reason for that. So she presented with decreased vision in her left eye, and this here is the affected eye. So I think that if you look at just the OCT, it gives you a lot of clues about what's going on in this 2080 eye. Um, the, the, the arrows point you to these large choroidal vessels, which are very um, juicy, very abnormal especially if they impinge on the Brooks membrane. So if you see large choroidal vessels right up on onto the Brooks membrane, you have to think about this um, special entity called pachychoroid or uh, thick choroid with um, abnormal choroidal vasculature. And you could see these vessels all around the skin that go all the way up to the, to the Brooks membrane. The other sort of uh, clue in this case is the, um, the separation between the RP and Brooks. This is a, sort of a shallow pigment epithelial detachment, very uh, flat looking pigment epithelial detachment. That should also alert you to, to a certain type of entities. And then these small serous PEDs, they're very peaked and, and very pointy serous PEDs. These are also clues. So, in general, when we see someone with uh, macular degeneration, we, we don't think about the type, we just start injecting. But sometimes it's helpful to think about what type of uh, choroidal neovascular membrane this is. So in the setting of large choroidal vessels, thick choroid, and this shallow PV, you have to think about polypoidal. Or, um, you know, you can call it pachychoroid neovasculopathy, but basically, you think about polyps and, and flat. Uh, so the polyps would be living in these peaked PEDs. And then over here, there'll be a, um, a branching vascular network. So the reason you want to think about this is it can help you when you decide what treatment to use. So in the United States, when we suspect um, polypoidal, we get ICG. But, but uh, if you don't have ICG, like I said, you know, you can get some clues from, from, the, um, from the OCT as well. 
So in the in the ICG, you can see this branching vascular network, which gives you sort of a, a diffuse uh, plaque looking thing. And on the borders of it, you see the tiny round little polyps that are uh, the markers of polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy. So here I will basically, um, and, you, and you can get the autofluorescent. It gives you a clue that maybe this patient had CSR in the past because they start out with central serous retinopathy and then over time, the RPE gets irritated and they develop the neovascular uh, degeneration. And the clue here is this trickling sort of fluid pattern uh, gives you maybe, maybe this patient had CSR in the past and that's why we asked her about the steroids. So again, uh, this classic OCT. And then here I will sort of open it to Dr. Megdi. You know, how else would you diagnose uh, these patients? And what, what is your initial therapy when you think about uh, polypoidal and pachychoroid? First of all, um, I mean, I like the case, but you, all, you have all the options there. You have the ICG, you have the OCT, you have the EDI, you have the OCT angio. But here in Egypt, we don't have the ICG. Unfortunately, some of the countries, we don't have the dye anymore or even the machine. So I always rely on OCT. And sometimes, as you said, it is not that conclusive because we can miss the polyp. But depending on OCTA is another issue. You need to be very you know, meticulous to look with the OCTA because sometimes OCTA can solve the problem. You can see this branching vascular network by OCTA, but the problem is you have to know where to look because it's not like a direct CNV. You see a lot of hemorrhage sometimes, a lot of exudation. You will never know where the CNV is. So looking at the structural OCT and then try to see where the elevation, as you showed us, the flat, irregular RP detachment, and then concentrate on this area by three and three millimeter cube by OCTA. Sometimes it's very efficient to find the polyp under the uh, elevated retinal pigment epithelium with OCTA. So if we don't have ICG, we can try the OCTA, though it's difficult in few cases as I met because of the hemorrhage, sometimes we have hemorrhagic RP detachment, but again, OCTA would be helpful if you don't have ICG, but ICG will solve the problem very quick. Second thing, initial therapy. Should we use intravitreal injection? We all know it's all, our, we are all, you know, it's available for all of us, intravitreal injection. And I always prefer to do that because again, we don't have PDT in Egypt, though PDT will work in these cases because the lesion is polypoidal, it's in the choroid, and we all know that PDT can help. And as you said, it could be a chronic CSC complicated by CMV. It's not a, a pure age-related macular degeneration. And we see some of these cases below 50, so we would know that this is a chronic CSC or even a pachychoroid without central serous retinopathy. And we all know that this is our part of the spectrum. Sometimes the pachychoroid turn up to be a CSC and sometimes the CSC is a pachychoroid. So I always start the injection and I prefer ILEA in these cases. But again, uh, PDT will help. I would do anti-VEGF if I don't have PDT. But if you have the availability of PDT, I think PDT might work alone and injection might work alone. Combination in the resistant cases in my, is my choice if I find resistant. So right. I would start by injection and show us what you did with your case, please. So as you said, ILEA is, is very effective in these cases. So there were a, bin, a bunch of studies using Avastin and Lucentis and they showed that the PDT was superior. But since this PLANET study that was done in Asia, we find that ILEA can, as monotherapy, be as effective as photodynamic therapy. And since that study, I usually, for, for all my uh, polypoidal or PACI CNV patients, I start with um, ILEA. So they were able to show that with ILEA, no patients required the rescue with PDT. So almost 80% of them, they were able to quiet down with just uh, monotherapy with ILEA. So this is what happened to this patient. So I gave her monthly ILEA until I completely flattened uh, the fluid and you could see some of the polyps even disappeared and the vision improved to 2040. And I thought this was a good time to start extending. Once I reach you know, maximum vision, uh, minimal fluid, I, uh, that's when I start extending. And the goal was to extend all the way up to maybe three months or even to stopping and, and going to PRN in these, in these uh, eyes. Manny, so, can I stop you for a second for this? Yeah, I mean, because this is, as you said, this is minimal fluid, but looking at this OCT, again, it's a sub RPE fluid. So you already flattened the retina. The retina is completely flat. And this is only sub RP fluid, and it is not our aim to flatten the RP because sometimes you will never be able to do that. Am I right about that? 
yeah, this is this is a, a excellent success. We don't want to flatten the RPE. We at this point we would begin to extend and we just monitor this sub RPE fluid if it's there, and sometimes it just stays there or organizes. But that's our goal is not to flatten the PED. You are correct. Yep. yep. So we begin extending, and unfortunately, we are unable to extend. So this is now every time I start to extend, the fluid comes back, and I'm stuck with this four week schedule in, in this uh, woman who's actually in a working age and doesn't want to come every four weeks. So at this point, uh, I'm stuck. You know, I can't extend beyond four weeks and I have to do something else. And so at that point, we discussed uh, PDT as, a, as an adjuvant. And so here, you know, if, if you do PDT, you have a lot of options. As you can see here, this is the ICG after these 15 injections, and you see some of the polyps are still there, even though the branching vascular network looks like it's shrunk a little bit, but most of the polyps are still there and the lesion is active. And here's an OCT angiography for uh, Dr. Magdi, and you can see the, the, the PED has flow inside it, so you know this membrane is still active, but we don't see the actual polyps. And that's sort of the um, weakness of, of uh, spectral domain OCT angiography. You can't see the, the flow in the, in the polyps themselves can be so slow and turbulent that they don't show up. So all you see is a branching vascular network, just like any CMB, but you don't see the large uh, round polyps. You don't see flow in them, at least. You can see them on the structural, but you don't see them as flow signal, unfortunately. So it can be tricky to to diagnose it with, uh, with, uh, with just OCT angiography. So at this point, we went ahead with uh, photodynamic therapy. And so in photodynamic therapy, you have the option of doing full fluence or half fluence. So half the, half the intensity of the laser, and then you could treat the entire lesion based on the ICG, or you could just treat it based on FA. Usually once we get to PDT, we use the ICG for guidance. And then you could decide to continue to inject or not inject. And, and those are all options uh, for, for, for you. But in general, for, for polypoidal, we start with full fluence. We use half fluence a lot in central serous. But for, for polypoidal, we start with full fluence. We guide it by the ICG. And then we see how the patient responds um, and decide whether or not to add anti -vegia. And so this is what happened with her, one full fluence uh, PDT completely flattened the uh, PED and resolved the fluid. There's some photoreceptor loss, as you can see here, and the vision is a little better than 2080, but uh, that's immediately after the PDT. You can see that the PDT also thinned out a lot of our large choroidal vessels and controlled this exudative component in the choroid, and maybe that's why you get long-term uh, longevity of the treatment in, in these eyes. And so we followed her and to see if she needs any more injections. And basically she stayed without needing injections for four, uh, for about, um, about a year afterwards. She hasn't needed an injection so far. Um, and that's uh, what happened with this. So ICG, ICG can be helpful, but PDP can be really dramatic in improving these cases. And so here's the summary for this case. So you want to think about polypoidal in any ethnicity. We see it in, in African-Americans and Caucasians and Hispanics and in Asian, Southeast Asians. So it's, it's very prevalent. It's not restricted to any ethnicity. Uh, look for these um, vessels in the choroid, these large dilated vessels that are bumping against the uh, Brooks membrane. And if they're associated with that shallow double layer, flat PD gives you more clues. If you see the peaked PEDs, it tells you where the polyps are, even without getting the ICG. And they may these polyps may be hard to see on, on OCT angiography. And as Dr. Megdi said, we try we start with monotherapy and a flibercept, and then PDT is an adjunct if it fails. But in other countries, I know that they start with PDT because it's a lot more cost effective. So you, you give the patient one injection and sort of uh, removes the need for many injections. So there's a sort of a decision line here, what, what you do based on the cost benefit for the patient. And then I always think about PCV, if someone I'm extending and is doing very well, and then suddenly has an explosive hemorrhage, explosive subretinal hemorrhage, 
even eyes that start out as regular AMD, regular CMDs, they can convert to polyps. And if they convert to polyps, then they tend to bleed and you have to keep a closer eye on them. So if the course of treatment changes dramatically, all of a sudden you think of a new polyp developing in an eye that didn't have it at the beginning. And uh, with that, I'll take questions and hear uh, with Dr. Megdi's opinions about this case. Would you do uh, anything different? No, I would, I would do different because I don't have PDT, but once I have resistance, as you said, I would, yeah. I would think of PDT because as you showed us, it's one year long-term without any recurrence mm -hmm. because PDT works on the origin of the cause, on the choroid. So as you mm -hmm. showed us, the choroidal vessels is getting smaller. And this is what happened with CSC, by the way. Still, mm -hmm. CSC is one of the best things to do with the PDT because it hits the pathology. It's mm -hmm. under there. We always, you know, closing the leaking point, giving intravitreal injection, it doesn't work in CSC. Only, the only thing is hitting the direct pathology is the PDT. So here, PDT has to be thought of once you have injected here as you started, because we all know that PDT still has some hazard. You still can use it, but injection is a little bit, you know, uh, safer. And again, PDT is the only rescue when you have patients with uh, many recurrences, you know, you cannot control by the intravitreal injection. And it, as you showed us, combined therapy is the best of these cases, and you could save the eye of this patient. I have a couple questions in here. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them uh, saying, uh, do you think that uh, on fast OCT may help in uh, sh showing the polyp in the PCV in, yeah, in case of there is no ICG? That's a great question. Sometimes it's very helpful because if you cut just below the RPE, you could see the round lesions that are very suggestive of polyps. I think that's a beautiful use of on fast OCT. Yeah, very and nice. I have another nice question. Is PCV always associated with pachycoroid? Yeah, that's a very good question. Not always. Some some people don't have the choroid and they get PCV. But yeah. usually we we look we look for the pachy as a sort of accompanying sign. But some people start just with polyps without the thick choroid, especially in older people. We see it sometimes in very thin choroids sometimes. Yeah, and uh, also some of the comments, not the question, that the key for the pachy choroid is to point to the PCV more than the new vascular MD. And I agree that some of the signs in the in the PCV is completely different. Like you don't find drusen sometimes. You yeah. said, as you said, hemorrhagic RP detachment is a very crucial sign in uh, polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy. We don't see it much with the new vascular MD. And also uh, the pachycoroid, most of the time, the age-related macular degeneration, you look at the choroid, you never find large dilated choroidal vessels. You find thinning of the choroid because it's aging, 70s, 80s. So you find thinning of the choroid. But if you find thick choroid, as you said, the, the sharp elevation of the retinal pigment epithelium. We don't find much of the drusen. We find sometimes, you know, hemorrhagic RP detachment. These are all positive signs for polypoidal. And differentiating this from vascular MD is very important. As you said, they are resistant sometimes to treatment. You need to inject more and more. And sometimes the only saving thing is PDT because you need to stop the pathology in the choroid. So this is uh, very uh, good. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of messages in this, but... We don't see, we used not to see much of PCV in Egypt, but nowadays we see it a lot because of the improvement in the imaging, in the structural wow. OCT, in the ICG, and in the OCTA. So nowadays we diagnose it. It was there, but we used not to diagnose PCV. We used to say it's an age-related macular degeneration. And once it comes in the 40s or early, uh, late 40s, and we cannot say it's a new vascular MD, we would say idiopathic CMD. We used to call it that, idiopathic CMD when it comes in the 30 years old, and we used to call it chronic CAC, sometimes complicated with CMD, but it's all the end of the spectrum of pachycoroid disease. So this is another very good point. If you keep injecting patients and they are not responding well, and you cannot extend, think of polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy. This is a very good message. Amen. Thanks, Dr. Amani, and I will, uh, I will move to my second uh, case. You see my screen now? Not yet. I will share it now. Okay. I think you can now. see it, right? There yes. Is. Okay. And I will have the full screen. This is my second case. This is a female patient. Look how young she is, 17 years old. She presented with a right diminution of vision, six. 36, and she's myopic, mild to moderate myopia. She's minus six in both eyes, minus six diopters. There is no astigmatism. 
and she had right gradual diminution of vision four weeks ago with recent metamorphopsia a couple of days ago. This is the annoying for her. She came with the metamorphopsia. And this is her right eye, as we can see, multiple white points, multifocal lesions at the posterior pole extending to the equator. And the myopic changes are well seen. And we can see the left fundus picture showing tilted optic disc and myopic orthogroid fundus. So this is her fluorescein angiography. We can see multiple or many uh, dots which show early hyperfluorescence and sort of late staining. Some of them, as I'm pointing here, can you see that pointer? It's pigmented lesions. So it sounds like these are old lesions. And this is another shiny lesion, nasal tetophobia. We can see that it shows minimal hyperfluorescence in the early, but very late, evident late staining. And I looked at her, it's a unilateral disease. And this is her fluorescein angiography at the initial visit. I think the diagnosis is obvious in this case, but Amani, would you agree that this is like a punctate inner choroidopathy because of the criteria I, I spoke about? Mazboot, I think so, yeah. This is very classic, the number of lesions. And you know, and, and you can be, you can divide and say this is PIC or this is multifocal, but we like to think of them as continuous. So it's a, in the spectrum of PIC multifocal choroiditis. Okay, and here is no, the uh, OCT. If there's, no, yeah, if there's no inflammation, then it's just multifocal. Yeah, there is no vitreous cells in there. And this is sometimes differentiated from multifocal choroiditis. We, in the choroiditis, sometimes we get one, one or two plus of the vitreous cells. And here is the OCT, the structural OCT, and I'm showing you the line scans. It's passing through this lesion. And I looked at it, it looks like it could be an inflammatory lesion, like choroiditis, and it could be a CMV. And I, and I looked at it and I said, would it be a CMV because of the metamorphosia? But again, it's very difficult sometimes to differentiate between focal choroiditis and choroidal nevus commentary. It's very crucial to look at the fluorescein angiography very carefully because in the choroiditis, you find early hypofluorescence and at the late stages, it starts to stain the lesion. But in CMV, you might find early hyperfluorescence. It's not that shiny. And again, staining of the late, at the late stage. So again, it's, it's very um, difficult to differentiate between both of them, especially when I look at the OCT, I find no much fluid. There is no much hemorrhage. There is no exudation. There is no sensory detachment around the lesion. So looking at this, we need to be confirmed that this is a CMV because we all know that multifocal choroiditis or um, PIC can be complicated by CMV. And this is the nomenclature of the PIC. It's punctate inner choroidopathy. And it's idiopathic, inflammatory, multifocal, choreoretinopathy that predominantly affects young myopic women, as in our case. There are multifocal, very well circumscribed, yellow, white spots. That's why it has to be in the differential diagnosis of the white dot syndrome. It's punctate lesions. There is no inflammatory cells in the vitreous. As Dr. Amani said, this is a good differential diagnosis. And mostly the patient comes in when they develop a CMV like this case. And when I did OCT angiography, it was conclusive that this is an evident CMV. But again, inflammatory CMV is different from age-related and myopic CMV. We don't see all the criteria on fluorescein or on OCT. So sometimes it's misleading. Sometimes we consider this like inflammation and we will never expect that there is a CMV down there and we should have done either ICG. But I think in these cases, OCTA can give us a very good clue that there is a CMV down there. Mm -hmm. And this is her left eye, as I said, nothing in left eye, only myopic contour. She is not complaining of this eye. She has 6-6 six, six vision in this eye. Again, multifocal choroiditis, sometimes it's unilateral, but it's commonly bilateral. Again, PIC again is a bilateral disease, but sometimes it's present unilateral. And this is, I started to give anti vegf because in, in the literature, we can use anti vegf in this, and it's very helpful. Yes, it's inflammatory, but it works with anti vegf so I gave her twice anti vegf and the vision regained to 612. And on OCT, we don't see much thickening in the structure OCT, though I said the structure OCT sometimes is misleading because we don't have much fluid, but at least the vision is better. I can see the lesion is getting smaller and minimal flow on the OCT. Three months later, she came back with drop vision to 636. And now we can see multiple 
I'm seeing thickening of the macula and shallow sensory detachment and multiple elevations at the level of the retinal pigment epithelium. And I did OCTA and I found again high flow in the vascular complex. And again, the activity is regained. Let me stop at this and ask Dr. Amani, would you treat this patient PRN or you do three injections as we used to do in all cases, like a loading dose? What do you think? Yeah, I look at the OCT really. I don't decide ahead of time how I'm going to treat them. And so one of the things that I look for when I'm treating these eyes is the evidence that the RPE is growing on top of the lesion. Mm -hmm. So if you see a thick white line on top of the lesion, that gives me feeling that the RPE is enveloping this lesion and that it's more quiet and I can start to extend or do PRN. But until that layer is of covering is there, the lesion seems to be active and tends to grow. So I, I basically treat until I see that line covering the entire, and it may be you know, one or two injections, maybe more. Uh, it just depends on the response of the, of the lesion itself. Yes, because we don't have like a randomized trial for these cases. We don't have large number. We cannot say that we start with loading those like other things. This is yeah. a message for the audience because we never know how they will behave. Come and on. the story is still not finished yet. So I give her injection again twice and she regained 612 vision. As Dr. Amani said, look at the OCT. This is like resolved uh, activity with elevated lesion, yes, but there is no thickening over, the foveal contour is regained, and I can look at the OCTE with very or minimal flow in the nevascular complex. And what's concerning me is the vision. She regained 612 vision, which is very good for her. And this is to start with and to finish with, this is the maximum vision she is going to get. Hmm. So this is her right eye. The story you, is not, uh, can, can, you, can you continue that? Yeah, I have a question here. So how yes. often uh, do you get an OCT angiography every time you see these patients? Yes, I do that because I have it on my, you know, my clinic, but I, yeah. I, I would count on the structure OCT, but sometimes looking at the structure OCT and the vision is very important because I've never count on the structure OCT alone in these cases. Yeah. I need the vision, the symptoms, and I do OCTA to help me guiding this thing, though sometimes OCTA is not helpful as we will see in the next eye. Okay. This is a good point, but you are ahead of me. Look at uh -huh. the left eye. Look at the left eye. Mm -hmm. The left eye during follow-up one year later. Look at the left eye. She came with blurring of vision. I know that this eye was six over six, and she had six nine vision. And this is the OCT finding at the outer retina. Look at Dr. Amani. I will enlarge the picture for you and give yeah. me a comment on the outer retina. There is yeah. not much full, I mean, pick you can see, yes, we find elevations. But there is something peculiar here at the outer retina. Yeah. Could you explain that? Yeah, I think these photoreceptors are not uh, doing very well. So this is a sort of a corollary to the case I'm going to present next and highlight this finding. Yeah. But photoreceptor lines, you could see maybe in the temporal side of the macula, they're normal. But then as you approach the fovea, they become very distorted and, and thick and abnormal. And then there's a very tiny pigment epithelial detachment just nasal to the fovea, and yes. it may be the source of all the problems here. It's a small, small separation between Brooks membrane and the RPE, but it's um, it's suggestive that something's going on there. That's um, and then with the overlying photoreceptor abnormalities too. I like this explanation, but let me show you. I, I'm leaving this picture, and I will explain. That's why we call it punctate inner choroidopathy. Mm -hmm. The lesion is the inner at the yeah. choroid, not the large choroidal basis. Something happening here, elevating the RPE, as Dr. Amani said, and then it will affect the metabolism of the photoreceptor. So yeah. this shaggy, or what they call sometimes in the papers, you will read that shrimp, which is shredded and uh, shredded. I mean, shrimp is the shredded and hyperreflective material from photoreceptor damage. So the pathology in the choroid, but again, it affects the photoreceptor. And this is why the patient comes sometimes with the blurring of vision, and we cannot explain why the vision is affected, though the foveal contour is there, there is no fluid, there is no hemorrhage, there is no CMV. But again, mm -hmm. there is blaring of vision and the patient is not satisfied. He's complaining of diminution of vision. Mm -hmm. And this is a large picture. Here is again, for the people who are asking, on fast OCT or fundus autofluorescence would give you the exact area where the lesions are, the old lesion and the new lesions, because this is the 
on fast OCT, we can delineate how many punctate inner choroidopathy in there, and some of them are encroaching on the fovea, and this is why the patient is complaining. The OCTA showed nothing, but the unfast can show you the extension and the foveal involvement, and we can see there is nothing by OCTA. So I used wow. OCTA here to exclude that there is no tiny CNV in these cases, and I would stop here and ask, Doctor, would you treat this patient systemically, like multifocal choroiditis? Yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, the audience is asking the same question. So if, if someone has bilateral disease and, and they get many recurrences, those are the patients, especially if they're young, that I refer to my colleagues in, in, uh, in the UVI test department and have them evaluate them for a safe and effective um, sort of systemic treatment if, if they're getting a lot of recurrences. But sometimes it's one recurrence every few years and you can manage it locally especially if the two eyes aren't active at the same time. And it depends really on the, on the, on the vision. So if, if a patient like in this situation has lost vision in the first eye and you're more concerned about the second eye, you might be tempted to think about systemic therapy. And in this situation, I really don't manage them myself because systemic steroids in young people is, is for a long yes. term is not a good option. So they really need rheumatology or your colleagues in, in, in immunology or, or uh, uveitis to help you manage them with some of the steroid sparing agents. If you think that they're gonna need long-term therapy because of many recurrences and risk for vision. And many, in many hospitals all over the world, they start using, as you said, steroids under the observation of, you know, rheumatologists yeah. or immunologists. And sometimes they use immune mediators like other, uh, you know, uh, white dot syndrome. But again, none of them are, you know, completely uh, approved for any of these diseases. And as you said, if it's bilateral, progressive, and the patient is complaining, we would find out that this patient needs systemic and we have to refer them to uveitis. But again, we will follow up this patient because this is not the end of the story. Two months later, visual acne dropped to 612. And we can see here, this is multiple line scans, that the lesion is under the fovea. Mm. So she got pick inside the fovea. We have here some tiny thing, disruption in the outer retinal layers, the retinal pigment epithelium is already penetrated, and mm -hmm. there is pick in the parafovial and under the center of the fovea, and this is why the vision decreased to 612. And again, I was afraid that this patient would develop a CNV, and I would not catch it, so I did OCTA, and I found nothing. So mm -hmm. I referred her, and she started the steroids, but two months later, she had multiple subfovial lesions, and the very annoying signs of metamorphopsy. And she told me, this is the same metamorphopsy yeah. I have in the right eye. So I looked at the OCT again, and I could not delineate any CNV. Right. The only thing I found is a CNV by OCTA. Look at the OCTA. There's a very tiny vascular complex, and we can see it in here. And look mm -hmm. at the on The on is very unusual. This looks like a butterfly. I've seen it in many cases of PIC, which yeah. I always do OCTA and on fast OCT, and I found this lesion. So this is a very early catch of choroidal vascular membrane, and the patient was the warning sign. She told me, I have metamorphopsy in this eye. I thought because of the polyp under the fovea, elevating the fovea. But again, this is a very tiny choroidal vascular membrane in there. So at this point, even with the rheumatologist, I started to inject her. And this mm -hmm. is a magnified picture for everybody to look. This is the color picture. We can see the pic. We can see multiple lesions inside the fovea. And we can see the choroidal neovascular membrane, which is easily delineated. And we can see the on -fuss. We can see the butterfly sign. So look always at this and think of pic. And I start to inject her. And after two intravitreal antivagic injections, she regained very good vision, by the way, 6-9 vision. And I could catch her very early. Though the structure OCT is not showing much, but elevation is less we can see that the elevation is a little bit less and the flow, it is there, but it's minimal. So this is the, to end the story, the right eye after two years, she had 612 vision and still looking at the OCTA and look at the on -fuss. The OCTA mm -hmm. show minimal flow, but it is not conclusive. I cannot count on it all the time. I would count as Dr. Amani said, on the structural OCT. There is no flow in the much flow, but here there is no fluid, the patient is not complaining, the metamorphopsia is gone, and I don't think this scar will go away. But the left eye, two years, she still have a 6-9 vision, 
I could save her because the fovea is not really affected much because we can see here the horizontal line scan. The fovea, yeah, the lesion is parafoveal, the CMV was parafoveal, and the fovea was spared. So she still have a six line vision after two years of follow up. So this is a very peculiar thing. Once yeah. you see PIC, always expect that the other I will be involved with on uh, in the future. And this is my quick message that PIC is a rare idiopathic inflammatory multifocal chorioretinopathy that predominantly affect young myopic. If you have a young female, moderate myopia, and multiple white lesion at the posterior pole, post equatorial, as we can see, without any intraocular inflammation, expect the PIC. And severe visual loss, the patient always comes in when they have CNV. This is another patient with a huge CNV in the center with all the manifestation. And fluorescein and OCT have been the gold standard. They are still the gold standard in the diagnosis and monitoring of CNV. But distinguishing active inflammatory lesion from CNV, sometimes we think it's a multifocal choroiditis, as this lesion I showed you in the right eye. OCTA might be helpful to delineate the CNV and always look at the fluorescein. When you have early hyperfluorescence and late staining, it's always a CNV. If this was hypofluorescence, like choroidal inflammatory mass, it will start by hypo and then it will start to take up the dye in the late phases. And again, OCTA may be helpful in early. Uh, delineating the CNV if the patient is complaining and you have to prove your uh, uh, diagnosis and you have to start injection, you have to have all multimodal imaging to do. And I think I give you a quick message, but I am open for any question. Do you need to chat with anything with Dr. Amani or we can have a couple yeah, of Yeah, I think there's uh, there's many questions about the treatment, you know, if you consider Ozerdex and when you consider systemic therapy, and I think we covered that. Um, yep. I think the important thing about OCT angiography is that even after full treatment, these neovascular nets do not disappear. They're yes. always sitting, living in the scars. And yeah. so even though OCT angiography is very important to start the treatment, it's, it's not helpful to stop the treatment. So that's why I think, you know, use it to find the nets and start the treatment with anti-VEGF. And to justify you your treatment, as I agree completely, to right. justify that you're going to inject the patient because you might say it's inflammatory, it, 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 there is no yeah. way to inject anti in inflammation, but to yeah. justify your treatment, to, I mean, this is a medical legal aspect also, to exactly. find the tool, to, to, I mean, to depend on. That's a very good point. And then you start your treatment, so if you don't find it, if you don't find any CNV, then there's a role for Ozerdex or uh, try try and sit alone, or, or if it's just an inflammatory lesion that's in the fovea and affecting the vision, then you can consider steroids alone instead of anti vegf But then uh, the question to you, Dr. Megdi, is is how often and how much do you treat? Do you use PRN or what schedule do you use after that? I, I always, one by one, I give injection, I see the symptoms, I see the structure OCT, and I aim to reach the maximum vision I could get, like 612, everything is dry, I stop injecting. Once the recurrence happens, I do again PRN. I never load the patient with three or four injections. Yeah, I think that I agree. To basically treat to stop the leakage, stop the fluid, and, and see that envelope with the RPE, and then you can stop and wait. If the patient tends to get a lot of recurrences, then you have to think about, especially if they're bilateralists, to think about uh, steroid sparing agents or long-term immunomodulators in these yes, guys. I think that it might help, like the MP and R white dot syndrome, you might try to uh, refer the patient. And I used to do that by myself at the beginning, but nowadays I refer the patient because I never know the, you know, the complications of this systemic exactly. therapy and yeah. the control. And there is a lot of systemic therapy now, new modulators, which yeah. might work. And we never know, uh, I mean, the complications of these things. Uh, um, any questions or shall we move to Dr. Amani to her next case? Please, please, Dr. Amani. Thanks. All right, so, so to continue in the same theme, so this is a, a, another young woman who comes in complaining of decreased vision in this eye, in this right eye. And um, the things that you, you wanna take uh, a look at is this multifocal scars that are arranged equatorially in, a, in, a, in an arc that gives you a clue about the disease. And then you look for multifocal lesions in the fovea but there isn't really much in the fovea. This lesion that I've got the arrow at is, is next to the fovea. But the main thing that brings her is her vision is hand motion. So you're looking for the reason why this vision is hand motion. 
So because of the arcuate arrangement of these scars, you think about multifocal choroiditis. So they tend to arrange themselves in these equatorial lines. It's called Schlegel lines after the person that first described them. No one knows really why they arrange themselves like that, but that's sort of a hallmark of uh, multifocal choroiditis. And there's a spectrum. So if they get a lot of anterior segment inflammation and vitreous inflammation, we basically treat them as uveitis and refer them to uveitis people. But in retina, mostly we see the ones that don't have inflammation that just come with these scars and, and then uh, new lesions posterior pole. So at this point, we have a sort of a puzzle. You know, We have all these lesions, none of them really in the fovea. So if you look at the fluorescein angiogram, like the patient in the last uh, case, there's these hyper, hyper fluorescent uh, lesions. Some are tiny, but none of them are smack dab in the fovea and the fovea appears to be spared. So nothing really so far explains the vision. So then you get, you get the OCT and you look for why the vision is, is down. So the, the closest lesion to the fovea is this lesion here. You can see it on the infrared and you also see it on the OCT. So there's a disruption of the RPE and then there's a material that's uh, on top of the RPE replacing the outer retina. Um, and then there's this another smaller lesion uh, similar with RPE elevation and disruption of the, uh, of the photoreceptor layers on top. But um, does anyone see why the vision is bad in this eye? Can anyone, does anyone have a clue? Yeah, so Dr. Rao, Dr. Rao is saying that the photoreceptors don't look very good. So if you look in the subfoveal area, you'll see this transition from very healthy, normal looking photoreceptors to very faint looking photoreceptors in the foveal area. And so that's basically the clue here. The photoreceptors are not doing very well. And if you look at the infrared, you'll see this, um, the lesion, and then you'll see a zone around it with the hyporeflectivity on the infrared. So this is normal infrared reflectivity, but there's this sort of uh, zone of infrared hyporeflectivity. It tells you where all the photoreceptors are uh, disrupted. And someone else is saying fundus autofluorescence. That's a, also a very good point. So one way to say if the photo, see if the photoreceptors are disrupted is to see if they're unmasked or if you're seeing the RPE layer underneath them better. So this is what happens to this patient. She gets better despite doing nothing. So I was doing the workup. I went, I sent her for, to look for an infectious etiology. And in the meantime, she disappeared and, and she came back. And you could see the fovea photoreceptors got better on their own. And the vision started to improve on its own. And the lesion, because it's just inflammatory, it started to heal on its own. And the photoreceptors around it also came back uh, to normal. So there's a few, I'll show you a few cases of this entity so that you can be aware of it when you, when you think about it in, in your practice. So this is another sort of similar case. There's, again, these white dots, which could be pick, it could be multifocal. We don't really try to differentiate them, uh, you know, very carefully at this point. Some are small, some are large, but they all have the same sort of nature characteristic of hypo um, hyporeflectivity. And here's uh, the role of uh, fundus autofluorescence, as uh, one of the audience said. So basically, the lesions are hypo autofluorescent. And then this is normal autofluorescence in the peripheral macula. But then you could see this big ring of hyper autofluorescence where the photoreceptors are disrupted. So they're, and they're sort of scattered outlying areas. So the lesions themselves induce this large swath of photoreceptor abnormality around them. And like I said, some, some of them get better. So here's an example of another um, eye that where the autofluorescence gets better uh, and the vision sometimes can get better with it. So here's uh, the example. You start out with this um, bad outer retinal uh, lesion with disruption of the RPE and photoreceptor loss in a large area. And there's another smaller lesion here. And then over time, the photoreceptors can come back. Uh, so I want to see, what, Dr. Megdi, have you seen cases like this before? And what would you do in, in this situation? It reminds me sometimes with the, as you said, white dot syndrome, they have a lot of things in common. 
But my my thinking now while I'm watching you, I like the case very much. But would you would you explain the hand motion vision due to the photoreceptor damage? I mean, even with the photoreceptor damage up to the you know complete destruction of the photoreceptor, we don't get hand motion. Am I right? Yeah, I mean, it was dramatic. I think the patient was also sort of uh, struck by the amount of vision loss. I mean, she said, hand motion count fingers, it's about the same, you know, it's just can't see compared to the 2020 other eye. She just can't see with this eye. The, you know, you, you could see the lines are sort of disrupted yes. in the yes. area. So maybe she could see something, but it's not, you know, formed musical vision. So, yeah. I have, I have something else in my mind because once we see the multiple evanescent white dot syndrome. We see the affection at the outer retina, but sometimes yeah. the vision drop is due to sort of optic neuritis in these cases, sometimes. Uh, because we do find central secret scotoma in these cases. We don't yeah. see hyperemic disc, but we can find out with the field that they have central visual field affection. And you clearly delineated that when you showed us the fundus autofluorescence. There is yeah. like th sick RPE in the central area with very high intensity fundus hyperautofluorescence, which means that the inflammation is affecting the RPE and sub secondary the photoreceptor is greatly affected by inflammation because it's the source of you know nourishment from the RPE. So I think they have a combined effect. The central area, and I think we should look at the optic nerve in these cases and try to evaluate if they have a sort of optic neuritis accompanying this condition because of the market drop of vision. And then again, the improvement without any treatment. You said within four weeks, she regained full vision without treatment, right? Right, but the photoreceptors also came back, so it's hard yes. to- Yes, this, this is very, yeah, I, I've never seen this happen except in, you know, multiple evanescent white dot syndrome, but yeah. I never catch a patient with multifocal choroiditis with the vision markedly drop yeah. like this. I found it with a central scotoma, vision 660, county finger 560, and color, you know, some of the, sometimes the color vision is not that good, but, yeah. Again, I found out that your case is peculiar because of the damage of the photoreceptor, which regained spontaneously. And this is a very good point, not to hurry treating this patient because sometimes right. it's a very transient inflammation and it can be spontaneously resolved. So I, I've met a couple of cases like this in multiple evanescent white dust syndrome, and I found lesions at the outer retina, but I've never seen a case with a hand motion and then comes back to sixes. But this is a very good point that yeah. we have to look carefully at the macula, at the outer retina, good structural OCT and evaluation of the patient. And sometimes follow up is quite good enough to regain the vision in these cases. So, so this is, um, I think this is an example of patient who, who didn't get better. So maybe this patient, like you said, Dr. Megby had, had, had that optic neuritis that we didn't notice. And here's a third patient, again, the same thing. So the, the, the lesion is hypoautofluorescent and then the photoreceptor loss. So the idea of why, why the hyperautofluorescence, so it's thought that the photoreceptors absorb some of the blue light that uh, is entering the eye. So if you don't have the photoreceptors, you basically don't have that absorption of the a blue light that excites the autofluorescence and you get exaggeration of the autofluorescence. It's basically unmasking of uh, the RPE autofluorescence. Although some of it also may be inflammatory in this case, I'm sure the RPE is not very, uh, very healthy. Um, but then over time, they can get better on their own. And this eye didn't have that bad vision. It was only 2,400, but again, she recovered. So in this situation, these days, we tend to, if the patient is symptomatic, to treat them with intravitreal uh, Ozerdex, actually. So we don't, you know, we, we may be trigger happy, but, but basically if we see the photoreceptor loss and the patient is symptomatic in the fovea, involving the fovea, then we, we tend to treat those eyes and not wait because we're worried that some of it may become permanent. So, um, you know, even though in the beginning we, we used to watch them and do nothing, uh, nowadays we're more, uh, we've had more success with, uh, with using Ozerdex. It makes the photoreceptors get better faster. And, and we try to treat the patients rather than just uh, watch them at this, uh, at this point. Um, so this is, uh, this is this patient after she got, she got better. And again, you could see here how sometimes multifocal choroiditis lesions heal with excavation. Yes. So sometimes you see these exca excavations years later when the multifocal choroiditis has healed 
and you're, you're wondering what caused it. So it could be a marker of old uh, multifocal choroiditis lesion. As the lesion heals, the choroid weakens and the RPE kind of sags out and you end up with normal photoreceptors, normal everything, but in a sort of a coloboma, small, tiny, little coloboma-like lesion. So that could be a, si a side effect of long-term um, multifocal choroiditis. So we have a couple of papers on this. I think the group in New York wrote about it too. And you know, you have to distinguish it from Azor because in these eyes you have a multifocal choroiditis lesion and it's surrounding, surrounded by this photoreceptor atrophy. Whereas in something like Azor, you don't have a focal lesion like the multifocal entity that started it. So those are two separate things and don't conflate them with each other. We think they're very separate because these can be very reversible and heal and they can respond. Although some of them don't respond and end up with a permanent vision loss. But you know, we think they're separate entities. For now, we treat them uh, as different things. And I think this is it. So in summary, you know, you can have this ring of photoreceptor dysfunction around the lesion. So uh, when you look at the OCT, look for that. And if, and if it's there, then you might consider using steroids to try to help the photoreceptors recover, um, local steroids. Uh, so, and despite that, in, in our series, we had some eyes that were treated with everything and did not gain, gain vision. And the loss in their vision was somewhat like Azor, but we still don't call them Azor, so don't don't confound those. And then it's always helpful to get the fundus autofluorescence or an AMFAS OCT or something that shows you the extent of photoreceptor loss around those uh, lesions uh, to try to delineate where the lesions are and, and then watch them as they get better. And uh, I'll take questions or Dr. Magdi, do you have yes, comments there, about it's, this case? No, it's, it's a very good, uh, you know, uh, sum up of the white lesions at the posterior pole. But I have a question from Dr. Raoul. He's saying that can you enumerate the, uh, the, the, the cases which had outer uh, retinal disruption and they regain the photoreceptor right. layer again? So I think you mentioned mutes. I think that's the most classic example where the photoreceptors are completely destroyed and then they come back spontaneously and very quickly and uh, and completely. Uh, yeah. That's basically the the hallmark. That's the number one that I can think of. I think these cases are also there. I think the third one that I can think of is, is syphilis. So you can get syphilitic um, photoreceptor sort of placoid syphilitic lesions that can be dramatic and you see absolutely no photoreceptors at all. And then over time, if you treat the patient, of course, if you treat them with penicillin, the photoreceptors will come back completely, come back as if nothing happened. Um, there's a third entity, but that's my third case. So I'll show you that case when we go back, when we go there. So uh, you have to wait uh, to hear about the third entity that the photoreceptors cover. Dr. Magdi, can you think of any other Types no, of uh, no, I mean, it's the, the spectrum of multifocal choroiditis, PIC, multiple evanescent white dot syndrome. We are all, I think, the, the, the one or, I mean, the, the beginning and the end of the spectrum. And we can see photoreceptor damage in these cases. And I think you highlighted a very good point that some of them regain vision, some of them are not. And we have to start treating these patients when the vision is markedly dropped. And I think intravitreal steroids might help because we used to, you know, fill up this patient with the steroids, immunosuppressives, and it doesn't work. It doesn't, you know, give the best result because we are attacking the inflammation inside the eye with a very simple Ozodex injection. And this is, I think, a very good choice when you have this. And I have another question for you. And the last one, what is the clinical workup in such cases? Do you do clinical workup? In such cases or you just yeah yeah i think i think it's important for yes. uh, to rule out infectious etiology that's my first uh thing like you know? syphilis you mentioned syphilis this yeah. is a very good point this is a very important um, yes especially when the photoreceptors are destroyed like this I, I like to rule out syphilis i think if the lesions look more placoid or or um, contiguous or larger i would also rule out tb as a, as a potential cause. If they look more placoid, that's one entity that you really want to catch because these patients, they need to be treated with triple anti-TB therapy. And if you just treat them with autoimmune and anti-inflammatory things, you might end up kind of spiraling into a long-term uh, worsening. 
So syphilis and TB are number one for me, usually to, to, to rule out in these cases. To rule out the infection. This is a very good point. Uh, always work up, I mean, to rule out infections and then start treating the patient because it's very, very hazardous to start injecting steroids in a patient who is infected and you might lose the eye. So this is a very good point in the workup. Exclude infection and then treat the patient as the white dot syndrome. That's a very good point. The other entity also you might want to think about is sarcoid. I don't know how prevalent sarcoid is in Egypt, but uh, here, you know, the lesions are also kind of multifocal. There's usually other things like um, uh, vasculitis yes. and yes. venous bleeding and venous sheathing and, and things like that. But they could present, their first presentation could be a multifocal lesion. And then, and then it would be helpful to diagnose them because if they have systemic sarcoid, then they need you know, their lungs evaluated and their systemic disease controlled as well. Yeah, so I think you wrapped up everything. This is very good uh, case and it opens a lot of discussion. I like that very much because it sounds like you summarized everything about the white dot syndrome. And Dr. Raoul is mentioning that you have a very good course in that in the academy. I advise anybody who goes to the academy to attend that because it's a very nice and comprehensive course about white dot syndrome because we always see white things and then we think about it and we start to work up these cases and we can, you know, uh, learn a lot from these cases. Thank so you. Uh, shall I move to my uh, last case? I don't see my screen. I don't know it's is there or not. Well, can you see my screen now? No, not yet. No, not me. You, you haven't showed it yet, yet. Yes, but I'm searching for it. I can't find it even. I mean, I'm pushing. If you click on the, on the Zoom itself, yeah, on the Zoom itself, and then you see the share screen. No, I already shared the screen. I pushed the button. I don't know what's going on, but I shared the screen. Oh, now it is. Now I can see it. Yeah, because it was not there. This is my last case, and it's a, it's a quick uh, case, but it's a very good message inside. This is a male patient, aged 70 years. He had right recent blurring vision, and he had right nucleus sclerosis. He's 70 years old, and he had left atrophy of the eye. He lost his eye during cataract operation 20 years ago. He's one eye patient had no systemic disease, he has no diabetes, hypertension, or anything. And his best corrected visual activity is 2040 with plus speed. This patient was uh, referred to me by one of my, you know, neighbors that he had a CMV and he need to be injected. And I scanned his picture. This is the fluorescein and the OCT head. And I scanned it and I looked at it. And the guy told me I need to be injected. They told me that that's why I came to you because it's one eye. And please advise me and I need to know if there is any hazard for this injection. And I looked at him and I asked him a couple of questions. Do you have any metamorphopsia? He said, no. How is your vision? He said, it's, you know, gradually decreasing, but I'm functioning with this eye. But I'm not satisfied with my vision lately. So I looked at the fundus and I looked at the fluorescein and I found that something is leaking in the parafoveal area. And I thought, yes, it could be a membrane. And I looked at the multiple line scans. He had multiple line scans and I found notched retinal pigment epithelium detachment. And I found that there is minimal thickening over this notched retinal pigment epithelium detachment. Mm -hmm. I always look at the patient and I ask the patient and I consult with the patient. Then I just ask my friend, should I inject him? He's one eye and he has no metamorphopsia. And it could be an early or occult CMV, but it's not manifest yet. But when I looked at him, I always look deep, look at this, under the retinal pigment epithelium attachment, I can see very well integrated retinal pigment epithelium. And the vertical line scan shows nothing. The foveal contour is again. And I always think, is it an early CNV? This patient presented to me in 2014, at the end of 2014, and he didn't have much of uh, OCTA. But at the beginning of 2015, I had the OCTA. But when I looked at him, I had the web source. And I repeated the OCT. And I looked at him. There is something pushing the retinal pigment epithelium. So I always look under the elevated retinal pigment epithelium. It could be a lesion down there. So when I looked carefully and I did the color from this picture and I found this lesion. Yeah. This is a nevus, huge nevus pushing the retinal pigment epithelium. And again, um, Dr. Amani, would the nevus be complicated by CNV? Is it possible? It's, it's one of the complications, Stavon, 
in, in, uh, in CNV, a secondary CNV to the nevus. But this looks very different. This is, uh, this is just a focal pigment epithelial, a serous pigment epithelial detachment. Yes. Uh, this because not, when you look at the OCT, and we yeah. used to teach not shed retinal pigment epithelial detachment, mostly harboring at CNV. That's why yeah. we used to teach. Notching, you have to be very careful because this notch means there is something under there pulling the retinal pigment epithelium and it could be a CNV. But always find the other criteria of CNV, fluid, exudation, drusen. There is nothing in there, nothing yeah. in this eye to say that this is an age-related macular degeneration. But I looked again and I had to do fundus autofluorescence and we can see the long-standing nevus, which can cause hyperautofluorescence surrounding by a ring of hypoautofluorescence, as we can see here. And this is the structural OCT. It's obvious that we have a nevus pushing the retinal pigment epithelium, causing elevated RP detachment. And I told the guy, we will only follow, you, follow up and we will see what will happen. Because I was afraid that it could be, again, a, a tiny CNV down there, and we don't see it. Mm -hmm. And I did ultrasound to exclude that it could be a malignant melanoma because we never know if it's a melanoma and even sometimes they look alike and the progression of the disease is inevitable in the malignant melanoma. But I looked at it and I consulted with the ultrasound. He said, yes, it is other activity, but there is nothing shadowing back there and probably it is a uh, nevus. And then I had the OCTA six months later and I was following the patient. When he comes in, I did OCTA. I found nothing down at the outer retina. So this is what the solid evidence for me that this patient had only elevated retinal pigment epithelium due to the nevus and probably the blurring of vision because of the encroaching on the fovea and mm -hmm. the photoreceptor might be affected in this area, but the, still the center of the fovea is still intact. Mm -hmm. And this is the, what I found in the literature. We can see the choroidal nevus arrangement. We have packed cells, melanocytes, and they push the chori capillaries, they even compress it. And we can see in the picture up there, it's from the literature, it's put, there is almost no chori capillaries, but look at the surrounding large choroidal vessels. Once they push the chori capillaries, you find dilated choroidal vessels, like this case, the nevus is pushing. There is almost no chori capillaries, and probably this is the cause of the pigment epitheliopus. Mm -hmm. Ischemia, elevation of the retinal pigment epithelium, and on the sides, you can find dilated and congested large choroidal vessels. So again, this is a very good finding, and this is other case I had to follow up in three, four years. Another signs you find over the nevus, multiple irregular RP attachment, and it's very suspicious sometimes, but look at the surrounding structure. The large choroidal vessels are dilated and congested, and the chori capillaries are gone, so it leads to elevation and irregularity at the level of the RPE, and sometimes we find drusen-like structure over this nevus. It is recorded, so we have to monitor this patient, and sometimes this patient will develop CNV during the follow-up, but this patient was followed up. This is a six-month follow-up. Nothing is changes, and this is nothing in there, and I followed up the patient for four years up till now. Same vision, same picture, even the notch is disappearing, but still retinal pigment epithelial attachment. This is in last year, 2019 in December. I'm following him up for four and a half years. Nothing had happened. And we all have to put in mind that choroidal nevus with overlying retinal pigment epithelial attachment are very rare entity, though it is there, but always look beneath the retina, look at the choroid, look at the real pathology down there and careful evaluation and meticulous interpretation of all imaging modality might spare hazard of unnecessary intravitreal injections, which we see it a lot these days for vitelliform, for nevus, for any lesion that it doesn't need injection and the patients sometimes are exposed to hazard of this injection for nothing. So this is my message. Always look deep, always think deep, look at the choroid because sometimes the clue is in the choroid and you can spare the injection for these patients. Dr. Amani, you have any questions for this? Yeah, this is a beautiful case. Yeah, and, uh, this is almost almost a giant drusen, you know, a right. giant drusen or giant drusenoid PD. Yes. And, and that's, these can happen also in, in, in AMD and they could stay silent for many years. So we don't rush to treat these if there's no fluid on top of them and, and they're staying quiet and, and they're not changing and the vision is not changing and the patient is asymptomatic. All of these are good reasons not to treat the patient. So uh, Dr. Rao again is asking if, uh, if you think um, if you looked at the chorocapillaris in these eyes, are they abnormal on OCTA? 
And would you uh, consider polypoidal as, as, a, as a differential for this lesion? Yes, it could be the differential. But once you find the nevus, I mean, it's very obvious. But again, there was no corticapillaries over the nevus. It's almost crushed. There is nothing down there because it's growing. It's a solid cell. I mean, a hard solid cells. So it pushed the corticapillaries. And you will find out that this is probably the cause of pigment epitheliopathy, like in the pachycoroid. We think that in the pachycoroid, the large choroidal vessels push the corticapillaries and push the retinal pigment epithelium. Here, the nevus itself, the cells will grow up horizontally and vertically, so it will squeeze the corticapillaries and you find no corticapillaries there. That's why sometimes we have to expect that C and D might be the complication in these cases. Amen. Very nice. Shall so we move to your case? Yeah, we'll do the last case so we can finish uh, before midnight. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, the last uh, case in this in this series. So this is now a 42-year-old who is continuing in the spots and the dots. So she had decreased vision in her uh, right eye um, in the last few weeks. And this is uh, what she had. So you could see here some clues there's uh, deep, creamy, white lesions, but there's also some pigment. So that gives you some, uh, some clue about the diagnosis. And then the other eye has a tiny little lesion here. So it's a bilateral entity, maybe asymmetric. And then you get the fluorescein. There's early hypoautofluorescence on the fluorescein. And then uh, there's uh, late hyperautofluorescence. So it's a transition from hypo to hyper. And the pigmentation is blocking here. I think some of the people online, Dr. Fergani, I think, has got uh, some ideas. And if you do ICG, there's uh, a lot of um, hypoautofluorescence in these lesions. So uh, these are sort of the clues for this diagnosis. And then the OCT basically clinches the diagnosis in this entity. This is very classic. You know, there's involvement of the outer nuclear layer and, and all the way down to the RPE just blocks of hyper autofluorescence. And then if you look in the superficial corticapillaris, there's smudging of the corticapillaris. So here you see normal corticapillaris in the, uh, underneath the lesion, there's something happening in the anterior choroid. So I think more people now, Dr. Tofi also got the answer. So this is basically MP, cute placoid multifocal posterior pigment epithelopathy. And you, you want to, again, rule out infections, right? So syphilitic placoid can look very much like this. So, um, so it, could be, it could be in the differential. So you want to, when you see these people, you want to think about syphilis and, and uh, possibly TB also, although we never see acute uh, TB choroidal serpiginous like this. Usually it's a more chronic entity. So those are the two big things you, you need to think about. So in acute lesions, you see this hyperreflective block uh, in all the outer retinal layers all the way to the photoreceptors and the RPE. And then if you look at the anterior choroid, it's also involved. It's not, uh, it's not normal. And so here's, here's another area of this lesion or over time, this is kind of what happens. So the area of acute lesion has, has this outer nuclear layer hyperreflectivity, but then over time, the hyperreflectivity goes away and you could see some thinning of the outer nuclear layer. So this is more a subacute lesion. And the thing is you could see acute and subacute lesions at the same time. So it's, it's very important to think about the first episode as a six weeks period. So they can have lesions coming and going and pigmenting and new lesions starting within the first six weeks. And it's all considered the first episode of AMPI. So don't start thinking about needing immunosuppression or putting patients on high dose steroids because the, the first acute lesion can last about six weeks. So keep that in mind. If you see pigmented and unpigmented lesions, they may all be the same episode, depending on how long they are. So here's uh, to go back to that question about photoreceptors coming back. So this is one of the yeah. patients I saw it, early on in, uh, at Northwestern. And she came in very disturbed with very bad vision, maybe 2080 or something like that, and horrible looking photoreceptors, almost no photoreceptors. And the worst thing about this lesion is you don't see the external limiting membrane. So I usually think that if I don't see the external limiting membrane, that means that the, these photoreceptors will never come back. This is a death, death sentence for the outer retina. 
But from this case, I learned that that's not the case in MP at least. So you could see here that the RPE becomes hyper proliferating or hyper autofluorescent. And then over time, like a, a, amazingly, the photoreceptors come back and the external limiting membrane come back. But this process takes many months. So patients are very nervous. They're very unhappy because they can't see. And, but if you follow them over time, there's a lot of healing in, in, in AMPI that happens. And it's almost unexpected because it's in areas where you don't think that there's any remnants of photoreceptors left and the photoreceptors will still recover. So this is, um, this is very instructive. For me, I learned a lot from this case. So in areas where this RPE hyper proliferation happens, somehow there's a healing or, um, I don't know, juices from the RPE that allow the photoreceptors to grow back and everything goes back to nearly normal. So this is over six months and, and I don't have the remaining follow-up, but it's a very, very slow process, but it can happen. How, can, I, can I ask you a question yeah. quickly before we forget sure, this? Sure, sure, how, sure. how is the vision correlated yeah. to this? So if the, if the photoreceptors come back, the vision comes back, but it could be very slow, you know? Um, so here's another example where this is baseline. You, you, you don't see the external limiting membrane in the lesion or any of the photoreceptors, yes. but then over time, look at that. The external limiting yeah. com comes back and the photoreceptors underneath it come back, but it could take 10 months, right? So it is a self-limited disease and we usually don't rush to treat them except in one uh, condition that Dr. Rao pointed out here that you have to be very careful with. So um, in, in general, we think this is an anterior choroiditis. So the chorio capillaris, the anterior chorio capillaris is involved. So you can see here this moth-eaten uh, chorio capillaris. The normal cor chorio capillaris looks like this. And then this moth-eaten chorio capillaris underneath the lesion. So um, another thing I wanted to point out is the difference on ICGA between MP and uh, mutes. So yeah. MP, because the anterior choroid is involved, there's non-perfusion of the anterior choroid. You could see that the lesions are hypo autofluorescence in the early and the late ICG. It's because the choroid, the anterior choroid is non-perfused. And so the, all the lesions are hypo. But in mutes early on, um, the, you can't see them. You have to wait until 30 minutes, maybe one hour on the ICG to, to see the entire extent of the lesions, the hypo uh, um, cyanescent lesion. And it's because it's not the choroid that's involved in mutes, it's basically the RPE. So in mutes, the RPE is sick and it's not taking up the ICG, uh, which normally it should. And so the areas where the RPE doesn't take up the ICG, it become hypo, autofluorescence and, and that uh, late thing. It doesn't happen acutely. You have to wait maybe 30 minutes to see it. So compare that to the lack of filling of the involved chorio capillaris and AMP. So those are two comparisons here. And then this entity. So if a patient with AMP has a headache, you have to take it very seriously. These patients have to go to the emergency room. You have to get the neurology involved as uh, one of the, the Dr. Ahmad said. These patients can be very sick very quickly. They can get CNS vasculitis and these patients can actually die. So in that situation, don't just treat them with steroid by yourself. You get neurology involved, you get an MRI, you get them imaged, maybe get a CSF, um, a CSF sample to look for pleocytosis. And these patients have to be admitted and treated with very high dose steroids under neurology, under real doctor, um, real doctors monitoring them, not an outpatient, not only you as, as a retina doctor. You don't want to be uh, involved in something that could be really serious and, and life-threatening like this. And then the other entity you have to think about is this relentless relapsing um, placoid entities. And those, like I said, not in the first six weeks, but you end up after the six weeks are over and everything is pigmented, you start with a new crop of lesions that appear later on. And those are the ones that uh, you have to think about this relentless relapsing. Um, some people call it ampigenous. Uh, you have to think about that. But before you do that, you have to rule out one very important entity, which is TB. Because TB serpigenous can look very much like regular yeah. MP ampigenous. 
And if you don't rule it out with quantifieron and, and all of that and treat it with anti-TB medications, you can end up really um, hurting the patients long-term. So uh, just to summarize, it's a self-limited, generally self-limited and, and excellent healing potential over time. But if you have headache or you have relapsing recurrent lesions, you have to be very careful, rule out CNS involvement and admit them, get them taken care of. And if you get relapses, you think about uh, TB and, and you get them worked up for TB and treated for TB. And I'll uh, see if Dr. Musa, have you seen any TB serpiginous in Egypt? Have yes, I had a case long, long time ago. She was an old female, 60, 60 something. And she presented with acute multifocal placoid pigment epitheliopathy. And she had to progress into serpiginous like, and I thought it's ampiginous. And I did her work up for TB. Beginning, it was negative, and then it turned out to be positive. Yeah. I sent her to the chest doctor and he said she has nothing. But I did all the investigation after that, and she turned out to be TB. Right. And we already started, I mean, some of the doctors started to give her steroids, and she got worse, of course, rapidly. But mm. I, again, in Egypt, we had a lot of TB. We never thought of MP as yeah. a, a coincident with TB. But always once you find multifocal lesions like the MP or the ampigenous, and there is, by the way, the MP, ampigenous, serpigenous, I mean, they are all end of the spectrum again these things are connected to each other once you find inflammation the behavior of the disease will tell you which one is going to be but the good point is to exclude tb at the beginning because we have a lot of tb in egypt even the extra pulmonary tb sometimes yeah. you do chest x-ray you find nothing and then you find out that the quantifron gold is positive you do other tests it's positive so we have to exclude tb and then go from there and again ampigenous i've seen a lot of serpigenous but not these days i don't know why it was 10 to 15 years ago. A lot of MP going to serpiginous, a lot of serpiginous, but not nowadays. I don't know up to now why, but you have a very good point in these cases. Exclude TB, exclude CNS involvement. This is a very, very good point. Yeah. And so the relentless one, I've seen it maybe 15 years ago in one of the Castro uh, you know, uh, uh, presentations, and I've seen the case, and they thought it's like inflammation. But it sounds like relentless because it was published. This paper was published that year. That was a long time ago. And yeah. it was very unusual to find, you know, very aggressive disease like this coming back and forth. And we have not seen much of it. But again, it's it's a lot of, you know, white dot syndrome again and multifocal lesions at the posterior pole. It's very important to rule out infection and to do all the investigation and to do the work up for these cases. So do you, do you, is there still BCG vaccination in Egypt? Yes, I think so. In the in the in the schools, they still do it up to now. Not yeah. all the schools, but they still do it. So that basically, this is something I learned from uh, Dr. Uh, Narsing Rao, who is who is a Doheny, and so he he used to do the B, the, the the skin test for TB, and yes. then anyone, even if they were vaccinated, if their uh, PPD test is over 15 millimeters, that's TB. That's new TB until uh, until proven otherwise. So, and we used to fight with the chest doctors and even in Los Angeles, because they said, oh, there's no other source, there's nothing else. And so sometimes it's just the eye that has the, the active TB yes. and the rest of the body is all healed. And so if you, if you suspect it, you have to fight with them to start triple therapy. You can't ignore that. And it's, it's tough, but you know, the, the problem is the organism lives in the RPE cells and it's nowhere else and it's hiding in the RPE cells. And yeah. so many of the tests can, can be negative and, and you just, sometimes we even started empiric therapy on our own because the TB doctors won't listen to us. And, you know, you just have to go with your, uh, you know, clinical judgment, especially in someone from an endemic area or someone from a, you know, from a socioeconomic situation yes. where you suspect yes. they have TB, they came from jail or if they, you know, live in a, in a highly endemic area, you just have to start the treatment and, and trust your, your clinical judgment. I do agree. And you touch a very good point because in Egypt also we, we see, you know, every now and then we see cases of TB and, you know, the main source now is shisha smoking because sometimes they don't, you know, change the things and they get TB from each other. It's, it's very, wow. very unusual here to find cases like this, but it is there. And in yeah. our area, as you said, we have to suspect TB every now and then, and we have to exclude it by all means. Otherwise, we should not start treating this, as you said, 
steroids or immunosuppressive in a case of TB, that will be very, I mean, devastating for the patient. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we have uh, uh, questions, but I have what uh, some some of the questions there. What what do you, what you have to do in positive quantiferon test and uh, negative chest X-ray in suspected yeah. TB choroiditis? Yeah, so if the quantiferon is positive, you basically treat them with triple therapy. They get triple therapy for six months, and then, um, you know, they treat it like active TB. And then you, I think they're on one drug for completion of a year. So it, it's just the eye that's involved. So positive quantiferon, basically, you treat them as TB, even if the chest X-ray is negative. Because do you call it extra pulmonary TB? And no. sometimes we find it, I found it in one case is to mention that it's ovarian TB. It was in the ovary. And wow. had, she had ascites, she had problems. And then they found out that she had extra pulmonary TB. I had never thought of that until she did a pelvic ultrasound. So wow. what, that was unusual for me to find out that. Yeah. So it's, it's very important to rule out that. And um, I, I don't know, we have a lot of you know, comments but, uh, about the TB and the treatment. But the, let me tell you that your last lecture is a very good one because of the imaging. The imaging, we used to say acute multifocal posterior pigment epiteliopathy. We used to say ampigenous, we used to say figinous, but nowadays we have OCT. So you highlighted a very good point, studying the OCT, looking at the outer retina layer, doing a very good, you know, high resolution OCT, line scans will delineate everything. And again, looking at the OCT is very crucial in these cases and the level of the pathology. We would know, as you said, the difference between the middles and the placoid pigment epiteliopathy and the multifocal choroiditis. We have to know where the pathology is. And this is recently published papers you showed us. It's very, very good delineating how we can differentiate between these things and we how to exclude the systemic workup. Thank you, Dr. Amani, for yeah, all thank these you very much. I really, really learned a lot. And I think all the attendees had learned yeah. a lot about the, you know, this is like a combination of different disease, medical retina cases, but I like the last part with the, you know, multiple white dot syndrome and also the differential diagnosis of the lesions at the posterior pole. Thank, thank you, you so, so much, much, Dr. Amani. Thank you. I will really enjoy that. And I knew that I would enjoy that, but we, I think we are on time. We are half, one and a half hour now, but it's really good. And I enjoyed that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Wael. Thank you all the attendees. I have seen a lot of attendees still with us. But I hope you can join us again on Sunday. We have another medical retina case uh, on Sunday. And Dr. Wael, you have the speaker now, please. Well, uh, I, I'm, I'm thanking you both very much. It was a very informative lecture. Uh, the, the cases were amazing out of this world. Very informative, uh, very well prepared, uh, and, and, and everything went uh, like very smoothly. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope everybody is as happy as I am with this lecture. It's, it's an amazing lecture. Thank you very much again. I would like to remind everybody that uh, on Saturday, we will have our fake emulsification in extreme situations, uh, surgical cases review. We have our, uh, our guests are Dr. Sharif Gernel and Dr. Yahya Salah. And I will be presenting with them some cases. And then on Monday, we have Dr. Uh, Deborah Goldstein uh, talking. And of course, Dr. Heba Metwelli will be talking to us on Wednesday about her strabismus course, the third part. And uh, that sums up our meeting today. Thank you very much, Dr. Magdi. Thank you very much, Thank Dr. Emani. Thank uh, you very much. It's an honor having you with us. Thank you very much, Wael. Yeah, this is great, great forum. And I really enjoyed the discussion with Dr. Magdi. It was a lot of fun. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. Thank you, Amelie. Thank you so much. It, it's my pleasure always to share with you and looking forward for next the next meeting. Thank you, Wael. And thank you. Everybody, we'll see everybody on Sunday for the debate, the medical uh, cases debate also. Inshallah. So uh, uh, see you on Sunday and thank Sunday. You. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye.